Live from the Pathway Studios in Johnston Proper, you are Live from the Path. Two live from the path. We're coming from the uh, Pathway Studios here in Johnston proper. Listen to me. Yeah, yeah. Hit, hit me with it right now. Listen to me. I'm ready. I'm, I'm, I'm speaking. I'm speaking to you, Christ follower. Yeah. I want you to hear me today. Sounds serious. Knock it off. <laughs> we're just, we're just. It's been a rough week for hair splitting and and religious type ph- pharisaical work going on in the Christian community. I'm just, we're just going to try to level the playing field a little bit here. Um. A lot of folks that you are talking to about Jesus don't have the faintest clue what you're talking about. <laughs> and the way that you're trying to talk about it is as if you're in some kind of uh, biblical studies class in college or a bunch of weird nuanced opinions that people like to uh, talk about and then argue about amongst themselves in the Christian community. And I need you to remember this week that you were transformed by the grace and mercy of Jesus Christ on the cross and the work of the Holy Spirit in your life. Those are the things that did it. Not your whiz-bang uh, thought process or your ability to write a well-rehearsed argument over why you disagree with Second Peter. <laughs> like these, I just, I, I feel like I've seen at least 10 examples this week of God's people doing exactly the opposite of what Jesus did when he went out and met some people who did not know who he was or who their father was and the way that he presented information, and uh, I just feel like we're, we're doing the big wiffle ball swing and a miss here. Yeah, yeah. I was reading, um, uh, is that part of Luke where that, uh, the demoniac was, the guy that was like uh, cutting, his, cutting himself with the stones and like uh, nude and whatever. And uh, it was, I, I'd forgotten this part, but Jesus and the disciples had gone out, and like Jesus saw this guy kind of um, in the way that he was acting and that he couldn't be bound by the chains or whatever. And uh, I think it was Luke's gospel records uh, Jesus turning to Peter and going, I think that guy celebrates Halloween. (laughs) I think that's how it went down. I think, and I think that's how he got got to this point, is he's been doing Halloween-y type of things. It's, you, it's stepping out of your own shoes, right? Like, it's, it's the hardest thing to teach your children when you, when you're teaching them to grow up and follow Christ, because you're actually doing the, you're trying to teach them the exact opposite that most of school is teaching them, where you're, you're, you're trying to say, look, you have to look at people as if they're blind, as if they're being deceived, and they don't understand what's actually going on here. And you don't want your children to have like this, um, I'm better than other people thought process, right? Or I've got this figured out and everyone else is wrong. But that is exactly how I want them to look at the world as a Christ follower, because you do know the truth and you do know what's going on. And you have to look, it's just like uh, Dan's classic for saying hurting people hurt people, right? So when my kids used to have a tussle with some jerk kid on the bus, right, who's four and acting like a complete rear end of a horse, and you would go, right, they would come home and be like, he was so mean to me and he said these terrible things. And like, look, uh, hurting people hurt people. I'm not saying the things that he said to you were kind because they weren't. But here's the two things that we care about. Is it true? Are you what he said? No. Well, then it doesn't matter. And two, people that try to cut you down and people that try to hurt you are normally hurting, they're usually hurting themselves. Inside, they're just dealing with a really nasty bucket of stuff and they only need to throw out what any, everybody else has thrown in, right? And so, but as they get older, they start to look at that and go, listen, this is, um, this is me like insta-judging people, you know, like, like taking a stance on them right away and going, hey, I've got this figured out and you don't. And it seems like a real judgy uh, standpoint to come from when you're dealing with other people. But it is exactly the one that Jesus came from, <laughs> right? We're like, I, I know what's really going on here. I know what my father created you to be. I know what this world was supposed to look like. And I'm v- inviting you out of the blindness that you're currently in. And so I, I, I think the reason I bring all that up is because sometimes it's looking out at the world and going, and one of them did have to have to do with the, the subject of Halloween. Yeah. If we, could be, if we can be really honest with ourselves, uh, when you have conversations about uh, our pagan following of All Hallows' Eve, 
Uh, everybody that you know that is not a Christian who's dressing up as the Wiggles or Barney or some other innocuous character that has nothing to do with All Hallows' Eve, um, you're speaking a completely different language than they care about, right? If you're trying to invite them to know the God that created them and, and, and say, this is what I'd like to vi- uh, invite you into as a disciple of Jesus Christ, and they come to find out that you're arguing over something that's actually not even happening. No one is pagan worshiping bones, and stuff, <laughs> right? Yeah, like, it's, it's just not happening. Nobody has a witch come to the door and gives them a Kit Kat and goes, you know, I think I will be part of the occult based <laughs> upon that s- sweet thing that, that that little kid has that they bought from the Target. I think Target's a curse I want to put on someone. Yeah, <laughs> I've been trying to get back to that curse. I'm glad, I'm glad this, I was reminded of it. <laughs> first, first of all, this, this is not happening. Uh, it's a commercialized holiday just like anything else. Uh, second of all, um, I don't care how it started. I th- actually think it started with religious connotations anyway. But, like, I don't even care what people have turned into it. Uh, the Lord can redeem whatever he wants to. It's the same reason I don't care that, like, there's, there's debate about whether Christians saw a pagan holiday and then decided to worship Jesus' birth on it. Mm-hmm. Well, God bless them. Yeah. I don't care. You could pick every day of the week and say, you know what, we're going to worship, say Jesus was born this day and we're going to celebrate. And I say, God bless that too. I, don't, I do not care. The, the Lord can redeem that. It's not like the, that spot on the calendar, uh, frankly, and even parts of the calendar that have shifted over the years. Not, it's not even the same day anymore. You understand <laughs> that, boys? It's not the same day. The calendar changes over time. And so, like, I just, you're getting caught up in something so dumb. Yeah, culture is irrelevant. J- just like the, the child sitting on Santa Claus's lap is not sitting there. They don't, might not even know who Jesus is. Like, I'm just, I don't know, I'm just doing Christmas. I'm just doing Santa right. Claus, you yeah. know. And, and we're like, well, you're not celebrating the right day for Jesus. They're like, I don't even know Jesus. I'm just getting a candy cane. Right. Yeah, we're you just, know, yeah, and we're like arguing over stuff that the they're The kids going, are just going out and having candy. Do you guys Honestly, seem angry? It looks like a community of people. That's yeah. what Halloween looks like to me. <laughs> Everybody turns on their lights, has food, and then invites people over. <laughs> right? I mean, it's the festival of booths. <laughs> I mean, this is, this is what we're doing. We're out as a community, and no one is actually going, oh, man, I hope the zombies show up because I have a, a allegiance to pledge to them. Right? No one is doing this. <laughs> and so I, I, I feel like it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a miss into understanding. Like, you have to be so buried in your, in your Christian hole to think that other people are actually doing this. And yeah, and, and, well, and I think uh, again, like it, you, it gives you the wrong bent. You look out and you go, you know what? These people need behavior modification. Right? Uh, they should stop dressing up as Freddy Krueger. Now, here's the deal: my, my kids probably would never do that because I have a sensitivity to it. There's something about it where I'm like, boy, that seems like it's putting something dark into the world. Why, why can't they be? They can be the rainbow or the owl. That's totally fine to me. <laughs> Lame. <And> so, <laughs> so, I don't want to be the owl again. <laughs> <laughs> or, he was pretty excited. Cream cheese really wanted to be an owl this year. Uh, of course, he thinks owls attack things and carry them off and eat them. He's right. Uh, <laughs> he's right about that. Yeah, so, pretty violent. But like, uh, but that's the thing is that like where where you do follow Jesus and you start to have a level of dis- like there's something in you that goes I'm not comfortable with this anymore. So you don't do those types of like you, you don't have follow every expression down its path. But like okay. So Christians will follow the Spirit in this particular manner, and then people who don't have the Spirit will act like they don't have the Spirit and probably have less discernment than you would appreciate. What are you going to do? Yeah. Not, you're going to bail? You're not going to be in any other place where the people lack spiritual discernment? Because, I mean, where are you going to live, friend? Hasn't COVID taught us anything? It's real isolating <laughs> to sit in your place and not be around everybody. And so, like, I guess I, let's, I just, maybe, maybe the encouragement is to say, why don't you look at the world with an eye for redemption? Yeah. Yes. That's how Jesus looked at the world. Not Why for, a, we, not for a, a, an eye of failure. And yeah. A, right? Because like, that, that's not how Jesus is looking at you. Well, because it's, an, because it's a duh. We've already done that. We've already established the failure part. We've moved on to the redemption. Like, Jesus only po- he points out the failure so that you can understand redemption. And so, like, do you bail on, like, hey, it's a community of people. Your whole, your whole neighborhood gets out, and they're all handing out candy. Nothing is particularly sinful or destructive. You just think there's some undertones of which some generational curse has got all, I don't know what, I'm not even concerned, sure what you're concerned about. Like, people aren't just going to, I've, I've talked to, like, I know, uh, uh, it's a warlock? Whatever the witch, <laughs> I can't remember, the, the male witch. Um, and, like, they, they think the Halloween thing is funny. Uh-huh. Like yeah. th- these guys, they're like they they are doing negative spiritual things that I uh, so want them to turn from. But like, it's not happening on that night. Yeah, they're not even invested in it. Like it's once again, it's the, it's the the cartoonish version of evil that you're running from. 
Right, like if that's right, you're point, you're you're chasing the pointy tailed devil. Correct, yeah. is which, what you're doing. which doesn't exist. Like one, you're you're uh, you're you're undervaluing. I wouldn't even want to say valuing. You're underestimating evil, right? You're making it like it's a like it's just a a, a funny thing that could be laughed off. And what a better triumph of evil for you to think that to think that it's not actually there's not a spiritual side of the world that we live in, and there aren't uh, there there isn't something that's trying to tempt you away from God's good will. Right, because that does exist, and if you think very light of it, and it could never happen to you, and it's not a big deal, and you could get involved with all this weirdness, and it's not a thing, well, then, yeah, yeah, it's a small victory, and that's how it's done. That's why it's a sneak, a sneaky, shrewd way of getting you to go, just not God, just not my dad, just not my creator, anything but that, right? And then it, you you wrap it all up and go, it's it's really this is where I'm going to tell you, fellas, it's all wrapped up in this in this holiday where all the kids dress up as all different kinds of characters. And then there's like these secret overlord undertones. Find someone that doesn't love Jesus and you'll never find them laughing faster than the whole premise you've just tried to introduce to them. And it sounds like a big cockamamie scheme, right? You're like, what are you even talking about? My kid is a stick of gum. Look at him. He's literally wearing a stick of gum today. And that's his costume. And he's inviting the devil in. Oh yes. Oh yes, he is. I No, he is not. Right, they're going to have a really hard time taking that in. So, so once again, uh, especially on the Halloween topic, if you have some kind of spiritual uh, conviction that you shouldn't have anything to do with this, I think you should bail on it. I got zero problems yeah, with all that. Right, step out. Right, no yep. judging on you. Right, like if yep. you're like, we don't want to get involved in it, don't get involved in it. I think that's fine. Um, but I think you should be real careful on what you're pointing out and like these weird undertones of things that don't actually exist. Right, if we're just we're we're not doing that. Kids are out walking around as cartoon characters and cupcakes. And like, yeah, there's a couple weird bad apples or whatever they want to yeah, dress yeah. as some, some kind of Some guy bought a, bought a Satan costume from uh, the Walmart and wore it around. Okay. That doesn't look like a biblical Satan at all. <laughs> it looks like a Dante Satan, which is also fictional. Yeah, or like a Bugs Bunny Satan. Like, these are just not, they're, they're not serious. Right. These aren't serious challenges to the spirituality. I think the, the fact that you're getting, you want to pray over that neighborhood as they walk? I think that's fantastic. Yeah. Like, because you have an eye for redemption. Mm-hmm. Lord, redeem, like, where I, I mean, I never, I never put a Satan costume on. I, I, I don't, why? Why would you even, like, I, I would never dip a toe in something for any particular reason, ever. But, like, uh, it's because, I, like, the Spirit's in me and says, ah, we just don't mess with that kind of thing. You've got groups that maybe you got a kid comes by in one of those things. He has no freaking clue. Yeah, right. So pray for that kid. He's ripe for redemption. And give him some candy. And, and ask him for a joke. <laughs> yeah. It just, it's, yeah, I just... I feel like it's just a big swing and a miss. And I, I feel like you guys are like, hey, why are you targeting me? This is my conviction. Blah, blah, blah. I understand what you're saying, right? And I, I know you're trying, to, you're trying to represent not taking light something that is a serious consequence within our world, right? But you have, to, you have to take it in through just outside your eyes to understand the broken, blind world that we're living in. They don't actually believe all the stuff that you're saying. They don't, they don't actually think that dressing up as a Power Ranger is worshiping some kind of witch because actually it's not. None of it is. They don't, they don't believe it. They're not trying to perceive it that way. They're not trying to sell it to other people that way. You are. You're the one that's trying to yeah, do that. Yeah, and, and they're not trying to scare the dead away. They, yeah, none of that. They're not <laughs> trying right. to raise people from the dead. They no. just want to wear a train costume, and their buddy is the train, and you're the front of the train, and they want to laugh at it, yeah. and then get candy. Well, yeah, and I, I guess like you should know, and this is, bears it out on a lot of the, the, the surveys and stuff that we've, we've looked at, is that like people are way l- more likely to be non-committal than wrongly committed? Like they're likely not to care. And so, like, w- where you feel, will you look overzealous on something particularly silly and that doesn't connect with them at all? Uh, like that will be a barrier for them to meet Jesus. To be honest, it's going to be barrier. Oh, you mean I can't dress up as a vacuum salesman anymore for Halloween because of the Lord of the Cre- the Lord of the Universe loves me? I'm missing it. Yeah. And so, I, yeah, just, just and, and like, this was tied up in a, we were talking about some stuff before the show, like, just the amount of, like, hair splitting on doctrinal issues, which are, like, I, I think smart people who love Jesus can talk out, but, like, can, let, let's start with, you know, do I know who Jesus is and that I, do I trust that he's good and is the Holy Spirit doing work around me? So if those things are validation that, like, God is real and is good, uh, maybe some of this other stuff is a little bit tertiary and we don't have to spend so much energy on it. Yeah, and maybe it's elevating ourselves to a stature that we don't actually have. Like Jesus tended to have, when he was having scholarly debates, he would have them with scholars, 
right? right? Like, yeah. a, especially if they were trying to use it in a way that was not glorifying or correct or, or, or loving towards humanity. He, just, he, wouldn't, he wouldn't tolerate it, right? But like, he was not having the same philosophical debates uh, with the woman at the well, correct? right? Yeah. Or the demoniac yeah. or anybody else that, that, that did not have the indwelling uh, presence of the Holy Spirit. You think it's possible he was just going as a nude man for Halloween? <laughs> <laughs> I'm going as a demoniac. Maybe this <laughs> was the, the, the first judgment on Halloween. That's it. We can only do this in the Decapolis. <laughs> <laughs> he was going as Adam. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> yeah, like uh, overall, I, uh, it's 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 simple stuff here, right? Like let's let's couple yeah. Matthew five with the Great Commission and go. What are you supposed to be doing with yourself? What are you supposed to be doing on a day to day? And are you doing things that are pointing in that direction? And are you are you handing your will over to God and saying, "Holy Spirit, I will take wherever you got me going," and then doing that? Or are you getting chogged down in like weird? I wouldn't even say weird because I'm sure they're important to you, but like philosophical debates about one verse, two verse, uh, broad broad ideas. Like we're not talking about not protecting um, the integrity of Scripture. Right? It's, it's pretty solid, and obviously we live out of it. But at the end of the day, if you're trying to have these arguments out loud, or you're spending all of your time doing this, then you're throwing five and the Great Commission right out the window and acting like your job was to be a Pharisee who cleans the outside of the dish. That's mm-hmm. what you're doing. You're cleaning up the outside of the dish. And it, yes, it does apply to you. That's what's going on here. So I, I, I really feel like, and these are people I love and respect them, and I think they really love Jesus, and I think they're just veered off to the right in this weird self-indulgence of knowing things and, and being able to talk to other people about what you know. And you're missing laying it all down and going, Holy Spirit, I don't care what I know. You tell me what you want me to know, and I will go do that. And God's heart has always been to seek and save the lost, right? Doctor for people who need doctors. That kind of thing. That's, that's God's area. And we're off in the weeds. I don't, I don't know what we're doing. <laughs> you're listening to Life from the Path. Uh, we just thought we'd open up with a sweet salvo that you can complain about. Hit us up on the complaint line. Maybe you think, hey, should we not, uh, actually, uh, yeah, boy, I hate to even open this conversation. Uh, maybe you think we shouldn't do Halloween. No one uses the chat. You think way. we're being flippant on it. I don't care. Complaint line is 515-517-0085. That's 515-517-0085. I think the, cons- the broad consideration here is, one, let's look at the world for restoration and let that even be within Christian circles. Okay. You got a guy that disagrees with you, with you theologically. If he loves Jesus and the Spirit's work in his life, then uh, l- let's just call that 90% good. If you both point to the same scripture and you go, yeah, we definitely believe it. We trust that it's God's word and we trust that it's good and we definitely believe it. Uh, we just are coming up with some different interpretations off that particular piece of scripture. Again, you're 90% down the road here, boys. And they're, they're just, just be careful of what you're really putting up a stink about. Uh, and then, like, is that where our energy needs to go into? Is is hand slapping and uh, maybe warning against things that seem super real to you, but like are super fake to the people that are actually in it? Like, the, the most dangerous person is looks is someone who looks at at something that says this is a risk to a different person, not me, but this is a risk to these people in this way, and like they may not even see the world in the same way that you're talking about. Do you know how many scripturally untrue things I've probably said about Jesus in my lifetime? You said seven tonight. Yeah. Yeah. Right? Right? Do I love Jesus, Ben? I've heard. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I agree. Have you seen the Holy Spirit do work in my life? Yes, I have. Do you know how unfair it is to follow people around and nitpick? Ferris, I'm telling you, I don't know how you're not seeing this. It's waiting for Jesus in in the wheat field to see if he eats on a Sunday. Exactly. That is exactly (laughs) what's happening. You and your long robes and your tassels are following the Lord of the universe around and his redneck homeless buddies and going, eat the wheat, I'm going to get you. We're going to nail you to the board so hard. That is literally what you're doing. You, uh, you're, you're blind to it. You're not seeing it. And we're, 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 we're asking you, if, if you're doing that, uh, you're, see it correctly this week. See it that you're doing that and stop it. Yeah, and, and so even, just, even as a tangible example, the first century Christians um, tried to go along with the shape of society uh, Daniel did this, right? Like, you, you see this in, in Christian example or, or Israelite example of, okay, how do we go along with the shape of things that are going on around us? We don't have to, like, totally Mennonite or monk the thing. How do we live in this thing without otherwise sacrificing our integrity? And so, like, you know, when the, when the, the, the emperors, when the, the, the governments would say, hey, you, you have to go and, you know, sacrifice to the emperor, they're like, we'll make a deal. We'll go through the process, but we'll pray for the emperor but to Yahweh. Does that work? 
Now, they said no. <laughs> uh, well, for some, th- some of them got away with it. Because, like, th- their thing was is that they're saying, we don't have to just blow everything up that we run into. Uh, can it be redeemed? Can, can this thing be redeemed? And they found ways to redeem it where they could. And so it, it's just, I think you just got to be careful as opposed to going, no, we have to bail out of anything that might contain any possible risk. We're talking about, hey, will you go in uh, and, and worship the emperor? And they're like, no, we'll worship Yahweh, but we'll pray for the emperor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Go. Yeah. Hey, we'll go on the we'll go on the Halloween thing, but no, no, no death costumes. We're yeah, gonna we'll go. Th- we'll go to the statue ceremony. We can't sacrifice to it. That's oh, right. We're certainly not going to bow down to the thing. But well, I mean, we'll go to the ceremony. Where else going? Yeah. No big deal. That's right. We don't mind showing honor to to someone who is uh, uh, the leader of the. It's just we can't do this. Th- this is where the line is, and we won't cross it. And so, I, I think that's maybe the core thing is um, if your instinct is to bail. Like, let's just start with, can, can this be redeemed first? Yes, you can redeem, you can redeem a pagan holiday that then becomes something where we celebrate Jesus' birth. Redeemed. Can be. That, that, so hold on, though. They're like, there's biblical examples of people that blow it up all the time. John the Baptist is a blow it up kind of guy. He's a blow it up on the religious leader, specifically. And Caesar. Uh, he, didn't, he didn't blow it. That's because that he claimed to be a religious leader. <laughs> right? That was his problem. If he would have claimed to be the king of the Jews... <laughs> Uh, he, he, John the Baptist wouldn't have gone and harassed him. There's plenty of other sinners in the world. He targeted him because he was a hypocritical religious leader. That's true. And like, I mean, now granted, there wasn't a whole lot of ink spilled on John the Baptist here, but like, you don't see him holding Tuesday get together parties with the, with the other religious leaders of the day. He's out there telling, he's out there preaching the gospel and, and, and saying the kingdom is at hand. And then when other people, religious people show up to snoot at it, he goes, what are you guys doing here? Yeah. <laughs> Who told you this was going down? Yeah. Uh. Okay. I just, I, we can do better than this. And I feel like more of us are guilty of it than we think. So I th- it's worth praying on. and make it, I, I'm not doing this about Halloween. I'm sure I'm doing this about something else. Probably some uh, slick-dressed preacher on TV or something. And I'm like, this guy's the worst. But like, honestly, I've probably, in, 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 in dealing with someone who's, whose kid just died, or who, can't, who has no idea who they are, I'm sure I've said something that is probably not 100% biblically accurate. Right, it's not straight out of the scriptures. It's probably a twisting of acts, whatever, and like all of it was probably said with, "Lord, just help, give me the words for whatever's going on here," because like this is, I don't know, I don't know how to speak to this well. Yeah, you know, and so like, I, I just, yeah. Anyway, it's it's done. I'm done with it. Sorry. Okay. All right, you're listening to Life in the Path. Uh, you know, I was looking, and I don't know if I have anything else that I want to. Mm, yeah. Actually, let's try this just real quick. There's an article um, from the Christian Post uh, called uh, What to Believe About Issues Jesus Didn't Discuss. So this is interesting because yeah. um, we have been, uh, my wife and I are going through a, a, a marriage book together, and like the hard part, the hard part about using Jesus as an example is Jesus, there's certain things Jesus didn't have to do. So he did not have to work through being wrong. Like, because he was just inherently right. He was implicitly humble and gen and and, and always right in his humility. Uh, I have to work through the notion of being wrong quite often, mm-hmm. and so like there, there's just there's some of those things about like the human experience that like although Jesus went through the temptation and su- succeeded or like at least as a human in his human form was aware and and like knows what it's like to be a tempted human. Um, he didn't have to deal with the aftermath of having succumbed to those in, their, in our fallible humanity. And, like, marriage is nothing if not a hotbed of succumbing to your human frailties <laughs> and then having someone be witness to it uh, all the time. And so, uh, anyway, it was, it's one of those—there's been a, a few different things where, like, okay, c- can we—in these types of situations, can we look to Jesus? Well, yes, we can. We think we have an example. However, there's a, plus, there's a place where Scripture actually doesn't address this type of thing through Jesus because— Jesus never was in this particular situation. A, more often than not, it's like, how do I handle being wrong or guilt or shame or things like this that Jesus wouldn't have experienced? And like some of the, the New Testament letters and stuff can help address that, but it, it's just been interesting. Yeah. Anyway, uh, this guy writes, uh, this is by Joseph Backholm. He says, a favorite argument of those trying to push the boundaries of Christian ethics is an argument from silence. It usually goes something like this. Jesus never talked about X, so that means he doesn't care. Mm. However, arguments from silence are a type of logical fallacy. The lack of evidence for something does not mean the gaps in our knowledge should be filled with assumptions. Furthermore, every parent who has heard their child say, you didn't see me do it, understands that those who depend most heavily on a lack of proof might not be prioritizing the truth. Agreed. 
every single one of my children who's taking candy and thinking I don't know about it. When it comes to the Christian life, arguments from silence are more than just sloppy thinking. They might also be evidence of a heart that is more interested in getting its own way than trying to live God's way. Um, da, 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 da. No, 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 no. When we justify our morally questionable decisions with the argument from silence, we put the cart before the horse. So I guess, when is, uh, can you think of, of situations where this is particularly happening? I see this happening on kind of major, major, major issues. So um, sexuality stuff and then like abort. Well, Jesus didn't talk about abortion. Well, I mean, yeah. not specifically, but you know. He never really talked about how to handle elevators. Uh, yes, agreed. Or how often to wash your hands. Yeah. In fact, I'll be honest with you. Jesus probably was not as frequent of a hand washer as you would have expected. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. The first instinct of a life surrender. I'd say instead of asking, is it okay if I do this? We should be asking, does God want me to do this? The first instinct of a life surrendered to God is to find out what he wants. Hey, let me think, think of this question. You ever think of that before watching a movie? Not, not, I don't even care about the contents of the movie. It's, it's, a, it's a G movie. It's a Muppet Christmas Carol. And you think to yourself, does God want me to watch this? Yeah. And you think, I mean... Yeah, he doesn't want me to do half the stuff I'm doing. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, did you really need to go to Walgreens? Well, no. No, yeah. I mean, <laughs> I could have... I don't know. I feel like that, that line of thinking actually turned me away from Christianity for like... 10 years. Oh. Huh. Right? Like where I, where I was hypercritical of every move I was making. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I was like, does God want me to do this? Is God involved in this? Is God going to slow this traffic down so I can cross this road? Mm-hmm. Obviously, if he doesn't slow the traffic down and I don't cross the road, then he doesn't want me there. And like, it was, it was driving me insane. Like, but I was like 10 at the time. I, I kind of look at this, it's, it's, I, I'm in, in Revelation, is it 12? Where uh, John's supposed to eat the, the scroll and it's sweet, but then yeah. it's bitter. And I was kind of talking about that the other day, talking about how it's it's like the, the word of God is so sweet. You 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 soak it in, and it's nuggets, and you're like excited, and you're like, yeah, this is good stuff. But then it turns a little sour. At some point, you're going, yeah, but I'm not living it, you know. And it starts getting a little bitter, or just society. The, the bitterness, I, I think, is you know, I can't always appreciate a good tune, you know. And there might be good musicians. They might have a great beat. It might, I might love the music, but then I hear the message and it, and it just turns it sour yeah. for me. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, I don't know if that's what, what you're going with here, but, but uh, with the movies, that, that's, that's how I am. Like, I'll, I'll, I might w- want to enjoy a movie and I can't. I just can't sometimes. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'm like, oh, why did I watch that? You know, it was like, just because just the message so often, even though it was good quality, good acting, good artist, artistry, you know, everything, yep. um, it, it just it turns bitter. Uh, in my soul, because I'm thinking uh, other people are 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 just soaking this stuff in. You know, uh, hey, this is how you live. This is how you do marriage, and it's like, right. no, it's not. It's not at all. Yeah, right, right. Actually, I was I was sitting down uh, to this this afternoon and was going to fold some laundry, and I thought uh, it was a big, pretty big pile. I said, I'm going to find something on the old uh, Netflix, yeah. and like I probably searched for five minutes, and I thought I I don't I don't know. I, I don't know if I'd click on any of these things. Yeah. And so I left it. I just ended up and I just turned the TV off, full laundry in silence. And I thought, man, I just, I didn't see it going this way. I just told my wife yesterday, I said, we had to really, really ought to cancel our Netflix just because we're, we're, we're paying for this bitterness. You're right. <laughs> for everyone else to be able to enjoy it. I'm like, ah, but they're, it's not bitter to them. They're just getting the sweetness and it's going to turn bitter. So, so I'm, I, this article didn't quite go the way I wanted. Uh, I mean, or that I was expecting. He says, um, he continues on, the God of the Bible demands daily submission for his glory and our pleasure because he loves us and understands that our sinful desires promise joy and satisfaction but deliver neither. Even Jesus, who is fully God and an equal member, member of the Trinity, was primarily focused on what God the Father wanted him to do. As Jesus said, truly, truly, I say to you, the Son can do nothing of his own accord but only what he sees the Father doing. For whatever the Father does, that the Son does likewise. It is folly to build our moral view of the world around what Jesus did not explicitly talk about. After all, Jesus didn't say anything about sexual assault or flying planes in the skyscrapers, yet we can still know what God thinks about them. As Christians, our desire should be to think biblically about everything. Even though the Bible doesn't provide explicit instructions on every issue or question we may encounter in life, the answers are not difficult to find if we actually want to find them. Yeah, it's, a, it's, a, it's an inerrant view of what Scripture designed to do anyway, right? Like it's it, not... A, not a handbook. You want to say errant. It's an errant view. It's an inerrant view. No, no, inerrant, that means... No. That's the opposite of what you're going for. It's a wrong view. I don't know that. Otherwise, I would have used it right the first time. <laughs> I know. I'd have corrected you. Get out of your stubbornness. It's an <laughs> errant... I'll yeah, just right, say... wrong. I'll say errant. It's a wrong. It's an errant view. No, that's not right. That's the guy. It's a fellow's name. It's a fellow's name. 
Okay, it's wrong. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. It's a wrong understanding. Mike is errant. It's, it's, it's a wrong <laughs> understanding of what Scripture was designed to do. And even not all of Scripture, right? Like in yeah. between books, right? Like they're designed to be to specific audiences, written in a specific way, crafted in a way. And, and like your Bible is way more on purpose than you're giving it credit for. And, and if, if, because it's on purpose, then you can look and say, was this designed to be a step-by-step moral handbook of how to make a decision in everyday life? No. No, it's not. No, yeah. And so if you show up asking that out of it, you're going to come up with, well, Jesus didn't speak to this correctly. Jesus wasn't trying to speak to it correctly, and so he didn't. Or you have him saying things that he didn't say, but, but making him say, well, he would have said this. Uh, you can scroll through uh, social media and find five people who say Jesus would get immunize, immunized, yeah. me, and five people say he wouldn't. Yeah. And, and it's like, well, I don't, I don't know that I can agree with either of you. I don't know what he would have I done. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. I really don't know. <laughs> yeah. Well, and like, I, I think that's a, that's a good broad, broad point, which is like all scripture, like no scripture that, that I think was actually designed that way. Like even the, we look at the Old Testament laws and we say there's so many. I'm like, so many, but like it, it doesn't, it's actually a different structure of law. Our law codes, the way that we look at law nowadays um, is exactly what we think. Like it will list, list down to like the tiniest detail, what's a crime, what's not. Uh, mm-hmm. And, like, if it's not explicitly listed as a crime, then you can't be convicted of it. Like, it's a very oh, yeah. technical, technicality type of uh, law situation. Yeah. Um, uh, the Bible wasn't, and most ancient Near East uh, law codes were not either. They weren't designed. They expected that people would take broad principles and then apply them. And then, like, the reason the laws kept getting, like, every, this is what happens in, in Leviticus, um, is that, like, God would give a set of laws, some basics one, basic ones, that there'd be a narrative where the people would go out and they'd do a bunch of crap wrong because they weren't interpreting these broad notions, and then God would get more specific. And, like, it would start to drill down, and that's how you ended up, even with the hundreds of laws that they had, it was still not near enough Mm -hmm. to be able to, like, govern everyday life. God always expected that wise people would consider principles and then apply them, and it always took human weighing and saying, well... Okay, it doesn't say anything about flying build like uh, planes into skyscrapers, but it says you can't even have anger in your heart. And so, okay, I think we've got an application that one, this is murder, and it was done with anger. And so, we can start to understand principles of how God looks at something like this. So, uh, yeah, I, th- I think it's asking the wrong thing out of Scripture. And I suppose the, uh, the core thing is, um, and th- we don't like this because it introduces risk. Anytime you feels like you're putting it into a human's hands. Like to say, well, if Jesus didn't say it explicitly, <laughs> now that's just your interpretation. Yeah, right. Yeah. So here's the thing is what does that echo, right? What does that phrase echo uh, from, say, the book of Genesis or when Jesus is out in the desert? Well, G- well, God didn't really say, or Jesus didn't really say. Right. You know, like Jesus didn't really speak to it. Okay, what's that sound like? It sounds like an invitation not to trust the goodness of God. That's what it sounds like. And like, once again, I think, I think the... The character of God is revealed enough in Scripture, and, and really, if you're honestly struggling, uh, I better have heard that you're praying on this thing, right, before you just shoot from the hip and go, well, I checked the moral guidebook, of which it's not, of the Bible, and it didn't speak specifically to this, so I guess I'm good to go. I guess I'm good to go ahead and roll. And so, like, uh, I, honestly, if, if you're following the character of God and God's heart on this thing and asking the Holy Spirit for guidance, I've not seen once God let you down. And bail on you and go, I see that you're about to choose sin out of complete lack of understanding on, on your part. I would like to leave you to that. That is the exact opposite of everything the scripture talks about. So that's hard to take in. Yeah, I would I say like of the types of things that people fight over from scripture and say, uh, where they're saying, well, Jesus says like meant this or Jesus intends this, like um, almost none of them are resolved on real technicalities. They're like, like a court. We were talking about this before the show started too. Is that like, um, just think of, of some people that I, I think are, are walking um, a path that is that is destructive to them, um, and like my basic questions to resolve the way that they are now viewing the world are really focused around: uh, is is God real? And if He's real, is He good? Because if He's those two things, now now we're just talking about like broad questions like does he say to do this thing or that thing like there's always a focus there's always a place and like it, more often than not it's not a disagreement over what the scripture said it's a disagreement over whether you want to a particular apply that scripture but if god is real and he's good then you have no choice but to apply it and so like it's really the core question past that like you want to talk about underlying definitions of words or like how do we extrapolate the notion of 
uh, uh, being a uh, turning the other cheek, and but also like standing firm for the gospel and not getting not getting trampled on. Like these are things that require study. Um, looking at the wholeness of Jesus's life and the reaction of Christians and prayerful thought um, and, and 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 wisdom, sure. But like, you know, it's it's generally not so. It's generally not so technical. Like, it's almost always breaks at. Uh, there's something I want to do, and I think I've got enough wiggle room to do it. Which is what the article is getting at. Is that like, are you looking? Are you looking to snuggle as far up to a line that that God has said for good? Or are you trying to run as far away from evil as possible and say, look, if this even sniffs like this, because that's what the Sermon on the Mount stuff sounds like, uh, not whether you actually killed your brother, but you were even angry at him. Like, that's, that's seeing where the line was from, from the ten words and then going, boy, how do I get as far away from that as I can? I repent of my anger. And then I don't even get near it. Uh, how do I get as far away from adultery as I can? You don't even look at somebody else lustfully. You just get away from it. And so, like... The, the, even the notion of how Jesus gives parameters and paradigms of which to live are always saying, you know the thing that's going to destroy you. Here's what it looks like to stay the crap back. And if you're trying to snuggle, like sneak under the line uh, and get as close to as possible, then I would, I, would, I would say that your heart's in the wrong spot. And you're, and you're putting risk because where God said something is good, why would you tempt like trying to grab a hold of something that was not good? Like that's foolishness. Dang. All yeah. right. Let's close that one. Oh, we're good. Let's close that one out. Are we let's done? Just, yeah, let's do, let's do some advice and let's call it a day. I feel like we yelled at everybody today. I yelled at people last time. Actually, I didn't even get, I, am, I, I lost the show. I don't know what I did with the last week's show when I yelled <laughs> at Buva. <laughs> oh, well, that's too bad. I, I mean, it's still on the computer. I, I'll, I'll pick it up this week. Maybe we'll get them double posted. I think that'll right, be a classic. Yeah, be classic. Dear Life from the Path, I recently attended a funeral with my mother's family. While I was visiting, one of my aunts confided that my mother cheated on my father while they were married. I'm sure my father has no idea about the affair. My parents' divorce was extremely ugly. My mother told us many things about our father that I now know are lies. Among them, they had fathered other children, was a pedophile, and had hidden bank accounts full of money in other countries. Because of her lies, my siblings idolize our mother and loathe my father. I think I could change their minds if I told them about her affair. I know the man she had the affair with and could prove what I'm saying. I hate hearing my siblings drag dad's name through the mud for things he never did knowing my mother continues to manipulate their emotions and opinions. Should I tell my siblings about her affair? I'm going to say the same thing to you that I say to just about everybody. Um, we don't hide true things. I'm not really sure your motivation here. I think, I, 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 I think it does matter. And I think yes. I, there's just no reason to hide the true things. A thing happened and you can say a thing happened. I think you've got to make sure that you don't weigh in and try to trying to shove the truth around and guide it on its uh, final destination. But, like, would I want to know that? Yeah. Would I, a guy that I've, I've, I've hated for 20 years and to find out it was all a lie and I was fooled into thinking a thing? Yeah, I think I would want to know that. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, like, well, so they, they roll it up uh, to a to more general question. Do you have a responsibility to come to the defense of people who are being maligned by things you know to be untrue? Yeah, it's how we answer all lies with truth. Yeah, yeah like do you, we have a reason to if a if a lie is permeating and doing work, do we have a do we have a, any good reason to throw truth out there and let truth do work? Yeah. yeah. I don't know I can't guide the work. Can't say what work is going to do or not do, but I feel like truth gets to gets to live. Yeah. Re- revealing the affair though has nothing to do with the falsehoods about the ex-husband. I think you come to the defense of the ex-husband of your dad and right yeah, the dad, mm-hmm. and 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 maybe you can say, "Hey, I, I, you know, mom's not everything. You know, there's two it takes two to tango here. They, they both have fault. Mom's not the angel you think she is. He's not the devil you think he is. Maybe we should work on a relationship. You know, try to try to go positive. I don't know if that helps to tear her down. That doesn't necessarily build him up. So uh, I th- the thing is, though, is like, are you really tearing her down? You're just saying a thing that happened. She right. tore herself down when she cheated on him. But I mean, I, I don't know that that helps any of this. On that, now you have two crappy parents. Don't you think it sets I mean, the precedent for how trustworthy her word could be? Yeah, I think that's the reason you would. The only reason that yeah. they would think about saying it is that, like, if they believe all these lies that the mom told, the only I, th- I think the thought is is the only way to get them to reverse that thinking is that they found out that their mom was not credible. I, I would do that, like that as a, a last witness. resort, maybe. But I, I would, I would, yeah, I would try to get that truth across. Mom, mom is not reliable. 
Yo, don't you think someone's going to say, hey, so say why? That'd be yeah, my yeah that's it. I'm, I'm trying to think. Uh, why not? <laughs> <laughs> I know what you say. So, oh, okay, now. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah, here's the thing is you're trying not to bust out of some kind of gossip hound. And be like, I got a new yeah. piece of information, blah, blah, yeah. blah. But, like, this one's pretty, pretty changing to the situation. Yeah. Right? Like, a, a guy that you thought was a pedophile had a million dollars stashed away in five other families. Come to find out that none of that was true. And he's like, he tried to tell you and you didn't listen. Because you were getting fed bad information from over yeah. here. I could, I could totally attest to this. This has totally happened to me in my life where someone's lying to me and I didn't know for years. And then someone tells me the truth and I'm like, you got to be kidding me. <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. it changed the way the whole thing oh, yeah, yeah. looked. I mean, it definitely does. And, and I think you need to work on trying to restore some relationship to dad. You think it's not necessary to pump out this bit of information? I think it's apples and oranges. I just, I just think it's like, I, I would, that, would, that would be... Down, down the road, I, I would say like, "Hey guys, I, I've heard stuff. I, I don't know. I'd have to think about it more how I would approach it, but, but it would be like, I'm, I have credible evidence that his dad is not everything mom says he was, and mom is not everything she says he was. Details, I don't know if that important. I There's mean, no way your brother would take this half-hearted political speech from you. <laughs> I, I no possible think- <laughs> way. <laughs> <laughs> I seriously, my brother said that to me. I say, what the heck are you even talking about? I, I'm yeah. just saying, do I need to know that that, that she had an affair with John over there? I, I mean. I don't know about bringing in the third guy and being I, like, verify I, this. That's kind of weird. Well, but, but I, I think that is what happens, though, is that, like, if you, because there's a lot of guilt behind the narrative if you have it wrong, if you've been mistreating your dad. And so, like, people are not going to be very quick to let it go yeah. that that they were wrong in what they've done. And so, like, I, I, I think that's the gap, is that, like, bless it if there's any possible way that you don't have to say this and the relationship with the dad can be restored. I don't see one path that where someone goes, hey, mom can't be. D- d- not everything she said was true, and they're gonna. But they obviously think it's true. They, this this protest had to have come up already yeah. from dad, and so like to change their minds, they're gonna need to to understand something has to fundamentally shift what they believe, and like that that you don't ultimately end up at this point just seems astronomical to me. Maybe, maybe I think it you're begins with a conversation with mom and saying, hey, you need to tell the kids. Oh, she's dead, isn't it? Her funeral? I thought it was her friend's family of her mom. Mm. Or was it at her mom's Mother's funeral? family. Oh, the mother's still alive. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'd start with mom and say, you need to come clean. Yes, always best. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, this changes the, ter- the terms a little yeah. bit. Did I'd you think it was the mom. mom, too? Yeah. I thought the mom was dead. <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh, yeah, if mom's dead, uh, yeah, it's a different story. Okay, okay. yeah, there's so no we reason you shouldn't angles. have this okay. conversation with mom and yeah. let her disseminate true things and say, eh. Now, yeah. do, are you, how do you feel about an ultimatum here? You need to tell them or I'm going to. Yeah. I well, feel yeah. that way about true things. I think we had that conversation when it was about the brother. Remember, there was a there was so, something about a brother, uh, and and uh, somebody knew about it. The brother knew about it, an affair that the other brother was having, and he was trying to decide whether he could tell the wife or something. And I say, yeah, you pump it out. And I say, yeah, yeah. yeah. The truth is like the, the the deed is done. The truth, uh, the truth is already true. This poor woman just isn't aware of it. Yeah, well, I'm gonna plan. I'm gonna plan a family weekend with all of us. I'm gonna give you two days to come clean, and if you don't do it, I am. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's fine. Yeah. We, we, we need to know this as a family. Okay, Secular says, Before I answer your question, ask yourself why your aunt confided that information to you. Were her motives pure, or does she dislike her sister? I don't think it matters. You say your father has no idea that your mother may have cheated, yet you recognize that their divorce was extremely ugly. Could infidelity, infidelity have had anything to do with it? And if so, whose? You also stated that your mother has spent years accusing your father of things he never did. The term for that is... Parental alienation. Oh, for heaven's sakes. Manipulating children like that is unhealthy because it gives them a skewed vision of what to expect from their own relationships. Yes, lying to people is bad. Yes. <laughs> you say you can prove what your aunt told you is true. To that I can only ask, how? Has it been confirmed by your mother's supposed lover? If it has been confirmed, I see no reason why you shouldn't disclose to your siblings what you were told. But unless you are 100% certain that it's true, my advice is to keep your mouth shut and let your aunt be the one who delivers the news. Uh, mm. Let's make aunt the gossip. Uh, yeah, I mean, I don't care if you if you say if it feels like it's better for the aunt to go to the mom. It's her sister. Hey, now the kids know you need to tell everybody directly, or I'm gonna. Okay, so here's, I don't care if the aunt does it. Here's the problem with my brain, my, my train of thought here is because I uh, my my rational thinking says uh, truth always gets to come out. Doesn't matter, right? But it's, I was trying to think if there was an occasion of which I'd say uh, let's bury the truth. In this situation, I would say this truth is hurting people. It needs to come out. We need to tell people. Uh, on the other hand, if uh, an 
a donor had paid for your college 20 years ago, and I found out that it was my uncle that had done it, and he wanted to remain anonymous, I would honor that and not let the truth come out, even though I knew the difference. So where in that thought process does, does the truth get to come out, and where in the thought process does the truth get to shade? Uh, I mean, I suppose it's a human, it's a notion of, is this, cor- is this continuing to cause, is this causing harm? Yeah, is it bringing negative well, into see, the situation? Actually, th- actually, let me be more precise. Is it causing sin? And I think in this instance it is. It is causing, it's, the lie is continuing to play out in such a way that it is causing, other, the li- that it is causing the lie to be perpetuated. Let's say a guy wanted to know who the donor was and he never was able to find out because someone wouldn't share it. There's no sin caused from there. The guy's just missing some information. But like the relationship with the dad is uh, misunderstood and then reacted to, like the, the father's not being honored, uh, and people are continuing to perpetuate and tell that lie and, um, because it, the, the truth was not told. And so I think that, that feels different to me. Yeah. Jesus didn't speak to this directly, though. So yeah. I get to do what I want. Do I feel like, Dan, you're struggling because to, to, to try to reveal the actual truth, you are basically have to impugn someone's character to get it going? I guess. If, is it possible to, to not do... I mean, what's your motivation in doing that? Is it just like, I'm going to show her? I mean, or is the goal to do some healing? Because right. I, all I need to know is mom wasn't truthful for me to go, well... I mean, the fact that she had an affair doesn't mean that she... That's right. Even a, a guy you catch lying doesn't mean they lied about every single thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's just saying, well, she's out having an affair. Um, maybe everything else she said was still true. Uh, you know, you know this, I just don't see how the c- connection... Yeah, that's true. He could be a pedophile, whether the mom is telling the truth or not. It's right. a, but, like, I suppose the question is, is, like, do you think he's a pedophile because you saw pictures of him dating young boys or because mom said it? Yeah, I like, that's right. why the mom's character matters. Is if yeah. they believe all these things based upon the fact that she said them, now you're trying to clarify. Well, if that's all you got going for, she's not trustworthy. Yeah, well, and that would be good to know, right? It, I, I, I think you're right. The, the flow of decision making needs to run first. You need to go talk to your mama. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And say, look, you've been lying to me because it's it's time to straighten this out. Let's you start ask this. some logical questions. Dad yeah. has millions of bucks. Have you seen evidence of that anywhere? Right. right. Uh, he he likes little boys or little girls. Have you seen evidence of that's right? He's running without with he law like intervention. A carousel in the backyard and a monk, pet monkey. Exactly. Uh, no, that was somebody else. That was yeah. Somebody I, else. I mean. Yeah. Does all this add up? Like, and stuff that you really believe about somebody in the heat of the moment when you're mad at them, you're like, yeah, he's probably all those things. And then, yeah. like, you start thinking about it and going, this don't line up at all. <laughs> yeah, right, right. Because right. when he was living with us, he drove like an 84 Buick and smoked Morley's. Exactly. You know what I'm, saying? Like, <laughs> I'm not sure I'd be doing that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, like, what's he holding out for? <laughs> yeah. He's like 92. Uh, <laughs> eat it. <laughs> right. He could have made a clean break with all of his millions years ago without all this hassle. Yeah. Yeah. And in the divorce, she got nothing. <laughs> it's just, and he had all the millions stashed away. Was he got the best attorney ever? Yeah, yeah, that did, yeah. Things are panning out. Yeah. So either way, though, I think it's okay. Like you don't you don't have to bury things. Yeah. Um, but like, as someone who has potentially harming news that of which you may personally benefit from its spreading, you got to be, I mean, triple careful and yeah. prayerful that you are handling this in a humble way that, for the most part, takes you out of it. Because I don't know that I could. I, I'd use that as a weapon. Yeah. Yeah, and, agreed. And it's, it's, not, it's irrelevant. That's why I think I might leave it to the ant. Yeah. Maybe it's to say, look, I, I don't know if I, th- I, I thank you for sharing. Um, I think the rest of my family needs to know. Um, but to be honest, I'm a little too close to it. I think I may not use it wisely, this information. And so, um, but I do think it needs to come out. Will you follow up with my mom? Yeah. yeah, and what's the odds, like, someone who's lied to you their whole life is going to turn around and whoop out the truth now just because you brought it up? They made a whole lifetime worth of lying. Right. I suppose you'd give them the chance. I'd give them a shot at it. Yeah. Hey, man, I heard this thing. And, like, I, you hate to grind someone who refuses to tell the truth, but, like, here's the thing. I think the truth does matter, especially when someone's on the other side of it. And so if she refuses to do, if, if the aunt says, look, you got to share, and then the aunt shares, and, like, maybe you got to go find the guy. Or maybe it doesn't matter. But, like, it, it should at least, like, it should have its day. Yeah. The truth should have its day. All right, last one. Ready? Yep. Dear life on the path. Can you help to illuminate people on what is proper etiquette after the passing of a loved one? 
We recently had a death in our family. As we were trying to say our goodbyes and get in touch with the immediate family, the word got out. Within an hour of the passing, the news was all over social media. We barely had time to react, let alone inform all of our family members. Many of them learned about it from these posts. Imagine finding out a loved one passed away from a non-family member's social media posting. It made an already painful situation even more so. People were hurt that they weren't informed before it was plastered all over the internet. Could you also point out that if you are the person who made the post from which someone found out about the death of a family member, rather than get defensive and say, I'm not the only one who posted it, or I wasn't the first to say something, just kindly offer your condolences and maybe an apology. Yeah, I mean, that's it, it is a little bit tough. Yeah. Uh, because to control those things, because people want to, they don't want to forget to come back to it. They want to show their sympathy. I mean, I think we do treat death a little bit passively on social media, but I, you know, it's, I think it's just a symptom. But um, I find it disingenuous when people say, like, rip, or uh, give it the rip. Yeah, well, they're like, I'm sorry to hear about the passing of, of Doris McClellan because right. they typed it and didn't handwrite it with Quillen. Quillen no, Inc. because they typed it and sent it out to a bunch of people who don't know who Doris McClellan is. Why don't they, you, they want to be the first to make the Why don't news? you call Doris McClellan's family and mm -hmm. offer your condolences and then let it be that? Well, it feels like the wrong time. There's a lot of funeral planning well, going on. Well, then wait. It doesn't mean you've got to pop something out right now. Yeah. This isn't about you. It's about Doris McClellan. I, I would family. encourage family or people to always wait for family to make an announcement like that, and then you can say something. But you can't if your family and somebody else did it first. I mean, you can't control a tidal wave. I mean, it just seems once again, it seems so disingenuous to me. Like because the whole point is to offer condolences to the people who are still living. Yeah. So you can totally do that on a personal level, even if you still want to do it on the internet, mm -hmm. do it over a, a text message or whatever. But, like, you doing it in front of a thousand of your friends is just so they can see that you've done it. Yeah. Hey, look, that guy's cool. He offered a condolence. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's true. Okay, so I think Dad's, uh, Dan's uh, suggestion is the right one. General etiquette means I wouldn't, like, if you're ever going to talk about someone's death on a social media, I would, sh like, share the post from the family or something. Yeah. Like, it's not your responsibility to do it. You don't want to take their words away. Um, or give them the chance to control how and what is said. Because, like, you never know how people are receiving that news. You don't know what the relationship was with the deceased. Um, you don't know what might, what might have gone on in the background. And, like, it's just, um, it's, there's no reason for your, you to be associated with it. And, and it could honestly be a close friend who was uh, closely associated with the situation that they're just grieving out loud, not even thinking, oh, his Aunt Bertha might not know about this. Yeah. And, and it, you know, they, they should have, held back but but they didn't think you know so you gotta have a little grace on both sides there I, and i'm coming from this from uh, an angle where uh, i received a call from my mom's maid once and said who said i'm really sorry to hear about your mom and i'm like uh well would she have a bad dinner i mean you know i did right I, she knew she was dead before i did right um and no and it wasn't social media but it was just like and she was just genuinely sorry you know she wasn't like haha let me be the one to tell you right uh, you, just, you just don't know. You don't know where people are at. So, yeah. Some people will do it to get, you know, the attention to get, oh, they're the first one I heard from John about Susan. Uh, but but some people are just genuinely like, oh, man, they're just saying it out, grieving out loud. And, and I mean, when you, you figure people it. that close to the situation who would grieve to that depth would have a little bit, they'd be a lot closer to the situation, right? Like, yeah, and, yeah. and have a little, where, I, I don't know, maybe I'm just mistrusting of folks, but like, when you, it, it's the same thing with people with like uh, talking to people they're in a relationship with about how much they love them over social media. Like, <laughs> yeah, you're yeah. sitting right next to them, or yeah, you know their phone people. number. It's just weird. It seems weird to me that you're having like a two person conversation in front of six hundred people. Yeah. Right. Same thing with the condolences. Like if you mend them, you would just tell me, you know, or you would call the people. I'm, I'm trying to think back of how I don't even remember how I responded when Booba's dad passed away. Yeah. And there was a handful of us in the hospital. So a handful of us knew about it. And, of course, his sons were there and, and wife. Um, I don't even remember. I have no idea. if, if uh, Maybe that was before. You know, we were definitely heavily involved in social mm -hmm. media. I don't know if I waited a day. I don't know if I wait. I, I'm sure I hopefully waited. I don't even remember. Yeah. I might have said in a private But you were really group. close to that situation, though, right? I mean, yeah, he, he was, you know. Yeah, still warm. I mean, it, right. it was it was it was a, a, a lot of stuff was happening in the hospital room. Um, 
And so I, I could see a situation where I could go out. I don't think I did, but, um, or I might have did it within our church group. But then some of them saw it and said, oh, no. And then they post, you know, I, I could see how things can get out of control quickly yeah. is my point. I, well, that's the um, thing. It probably doesn't take much to slip through the cracks. And like a friend of a friend of a friend, they who and I knew him. And yeah, I, oh, I yeah. had lunch with him once. And um, I, so I don't know. I don't know. I don't know how to answer just, that. It's just the farther away that you get from like the actual relationship with the person. I think the thing that I'm struggling with is like, um, it's not about you at all, right? Right. It's about right. the person that passed away and their right. and their family and their Immediate very close family, friends. Let them right. And like you're six that. people removed from this, but like you met them once and they were cool, and like you're like, oh, I'm so sorry they passed. But like, does that really need to go on as a public announcement on your friend group on social media? It's not right. about you. Right. Just be quiet. It just it, it, there's just an inherent selfishness in there that I that I'm missing, mm-hmm. right? Like you you didn't know them that well, but you did like them, and they were cool, and you're sorry that they passed away, and you feel sorry for their family. Mm-hmm. Well, tell their family, right? Don't tell everybody you know. They don't know them. You're already six people out. Yeah, I always have that problem. To be honest, with um, even like writing in cards, yeah, uh, like it makes me feel like uh, like it's grandiose. Like I'm trying to wordsmith something that I would be proud to have written. Mm-hmm. I'm like, well, this is like it this might, will touch their heart. Yeah, yeah. like I like, uh, yeah. I don't know. Like I'm very. It's odd because generally speaking, I'm a pretty decent writer. But when it comes to like having to write a note like that or something in a card, like I can't do it. Yeah, uh, because it all because it feels like posturing to me. I have my wife and kids do it. Like uh, my oldest daughter and my wife are good at that kind of thing. They can just kind of write something out, and like it mean they they do it well. I just I, I really struggle with it because mm-hmm. it, like I just don't nothing that feels like posturing. I don't ever comment on something of any substance on the Facebook for that very reason. Mm-hmm. I'm like I don't I feel like this is going to be about my words, and I don't really care. Yeah, just don't care to do that. Yeah, okay. yeah. So I so I would I would say uh, restraint caution is 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 probably key here. Yeah. Um, when in doubt. Communicate uh, p- privately, for one. Um, don't assume that you're you're the Paul Revere here, <laughs> who's making sure the world knows. Uh, if CNN wants to break the story, it'll show up. Otherwise, maybe let the family handle it, because mm-hmm. um, you just never know what you're walking into, and you're not doing them a service unless they tell you. Unless they say, "Hey, will you let everybody know?" Then you're doing them a service. But don't don't assume that the people haven't thought of. Oh, hey, I need to tell other other people. They've thought of it. They yeah. probably just have not chosen you. And so just, you know, wait it out. Yeah. Okay, Secular says, Please accept my sympathy for your loss. I am sure that feelings are raw because people are hurting, but real. But please realize that because of social media, news travels like wildfire. For a friend to be told and then to post the sad news wouldn't be unusual these days. However, to heed something like that off before it happened, the person who spilled the beans should have asked the friend to keep the news private until all family members were personally informed. That said... Since there were hurt feelings, apologies are in order. Yeah, I don't know if I'd make someone apologize. I, you know, like, yeah. I, I, it's one of those things where you hope people get it right, but there just really isn't much of a consequence for getting it wrong because there's no value in rectifying it. Right. No one's coming back to life. The news is not being sucked back into the vacuum. Uh, the ship has sailed, and so I, I would actually just let it go. Yeah. Yeah, it's already done. Yeah. Okay. Hey, you've been listening live from the path. We really appreciate you hanging out with us uh, tonight. Hopefully, uh, you've been waiting with bated breath for the next uh, episode of the show, and I owe you two. And so I'm going to grab them both tonight, and we'll try to get these popped out for you here in the next day or so, so that you may uh, go home and enjoy them. In the, uh, let's see, if you've got any comments for us, uh, feel free to give us a shot on the complaint line. That's call or text 515-517-0085. Just anything you, uh, any feedback for the show or uh, comments on our bad advice or whatever it is. Also, if you could leave us a review on uh, your favorite podcasting app, uh, it may or may not help, but we think you should probably do it. And uh, other than that, uh, we'll try to hook up with you here uh, again next week. In the meantime, be faithful to the means. God will handle the ends. You've been listening to Live from the Path.